want to um, just go over the day of the Lord versus the day of Christ. Now, I've preached this before here. I alluded to it in not very long ago um, in that four message series on the end times. And since this is the doctrine that we are, this is where we are scripturally today, okay, um, in our study of Pauline doctrine and following Paul chronologically, this is the first book, First Thessalonians. Uh, turn there if you haven't turned there yet. Uh, it's the first book that he wrote. You remember that uh, the Bereans were more noble. In the book of Acts, Paul speaks of the Bereans being more noble than those at Thessalonica because the believers at Berea searched the scriptures daily to see whether these uh, things were true, whether they were so. Now, the Thessalonians weren't as active um, scripturally. They weren't digging into, into the um, letters that were being circulated and studying the scriptures. They were a little lazy, okay? Um, I'm afraid many, if not most Christians today, are more like Thessalonian Christians. They're lazy in their study of the word of God. I'm not going to ask for hands, but um, it's possible some might be um, embarrassed if I were to say, did you read your Bible yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the day before that daily, okay? So it's important that you don't just, you know, lean on the pastor here uh, or, you know, some and I don't have a problem with devotional books, but I think we ought to make sure that we read the Bible every day, okay? You eat three times a day, four times a day, five times a day. Let's get the ice cream and cookies and candy in there too between, you know, between meals. Physically, how many times are we feasting on the word of God spiritually, okay? All right, so there was some confusion about the second coming of Christ. Now, I don't think I have to spend more than a minute or two refreshing our memories about the doctrine of the second coming. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Period, exclamation point, from here, never ending. He is coming back. The longer he takes, that's from our point of view, he knows the day or the hour. I'm sure the father has shared it with the son by now. Okay, <laughs> You know, while, while he was here, um, the disciples asked him about the day, you know, and the hour, and he said, that's the, that's the, the father knows that's reserved for the father. But um, there's no question about the fact that Jesus Christ is God, and so um, as God, and particularly now in his glorified self, he knows that day, that hour, that moment, that he will stand up. Remember, Stephen saw him standing at the right hand of God, not seated. The scriptures teach us that now Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, but he was still standing. It's like his ministry to Israel was not yet finished until they stoned Stephen, and then there was no more opportunity. From that point, Paul picks up the ball, and we have Romans 9, 10, and 11, and Paul is sobbing, basically, over his brethren in the flesh who will not believe. But they will believe. And the remnant will be saved, and Jesus Christ will come again. Now, the Bible teaches in the New Testament very clearly, and Paul teaches that he's coming two times, okay? He's coming twice. The second coming of Christ is not just a one-time happening. It's a twofold happening. He is going to come in the clouds first to call away, catch away the church, the bride, believers. Not any particular church, not any particular label, okay? But all those who have trusted Christ from the first century until the last century, okay, last decade, last month, last day, all right, he is going to call his bride to be with him in glory forever. First, of course, we will be purified and then we will serve. All right, now, there is a second part to that second coming, and that's when I was going to use the board, and I'm not faulting Sue at all. She didn't know, but I was going to use the board, and then when I came in, I thought, I don't have the time to do all of this, so I'm going to get it cleaned off enough, so I'll try to illustrate with my hands, you know, and kind of draw things over here. Okay, so we'd have two columns, and here we would have the rapture of the church. Okay, that's the first part of the second coming, and after that, we would have the revelation of Jesus Christ. That would be the second part of the second coming, when he comes to save Israel from the Antichrist and the United Nations armies, uh, global armies, who will be assembled against her. And there are several end time battles. The last one, of course, being the Battle of Armageddon. 
And uh, that battle will be precipitated by the second coming of Christ. It will take him 24 hours, called the day of the Lord. It will take him 24 hours to get from, from where he bursts upon the scene in the sky. This is the king's highway. It's all laid out in the Old Testament. It's a 24-hour trip from the time he shows up to the world and he stands on the Mount of Olives and splits it in two. And during that time, the Battle of Armageddon takes place, and I think you know enough about Armageddon that I don't have to give you, you know, a, a picture of that, a verbal picture of that. You've all probably seen the movies, and you've all read the books, and you've all heard the term Armageddon, okay? Well, it's going to happen. And the Bible in the book of Revelation clearly delineates what Armageddon will be like, and the Old Testament prophets like Joel and Amos and others, again, Isaiah and, and Jeremiah also give us a clear picture of what is called the day of the Lord. All right, now there are actually three days of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. There is number one, and in the Old Testament we find this one too, the day of the Lord. That one we find in the Old Testament, okay? And we find it over and over and over again. And I will read some passages from the Old Testament, Lord willing, before I'm finished this morning. Okay, so we find the day of the Lord. That is the predominant... Um, quotation, if you could call it that, from the Bible. I mean, you find the day of the Lord many more times than you find the day of Christ and the day of the Lord Jesus, okay? Particularly the day of the Lord Jesus, which you find only once. Okay, so there's the day of the Lord that's found both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the day of the Lord is clearly scripturally a reference to the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, his coming to this earth, not in the clouds for the church, but to this earth to save Israel and set up his millennial kingdom. All right, that's the day of the Lord. There's a lot of confusion, unfortunately, between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ, which we find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2. All right, the day of Christ is a reference to the rapture. Now, we have some other references, like 1 Corinthians 15, to the rapture, but it's not called the day of Christ anywhere else but in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2. And then we also find in the book of Philippians, Paul talking to us about the day of the Lord Jesus. So we have the day of the Lord, the day, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, and then between the two, on top of the two, if I was charting this out, the day of the Lord Jesus. Because the day of the Lord Jesus is the period of time in which the church will be purified in heaven before we are prepared to be that bride uh, adorned for the bridegroom in pure white robes that it shows up in the book of Revelation, the bride of Christ, okay? So there's a purification process that started the day we got saved, and it will end at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul tells us two times in the New Testament, in his writings, Romans and Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, about the judgment seat of Christ, okay? But I want to particularly center in on the day of the Lord versus the day of Christ. Now, I'm going to read several passages. I'm going to begin in 1 Thessalonians. I don't think in all these studies I've done this yet, so I'm going to do it now. So only so much time, <laughs> but I, I'm, going to stay, I'm going to try to stay on point here, <clears throat> and so I'm going to read all of these passages, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 5, 1 through 9, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 14. All right. Here we go. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. This is chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 13. That is unknowing. But we shouldn't be ignorant in our lifestyle either, in our behavior and whatever. But, and notice the word brethren, by the way. I'm going to read out of another Bible here. It's going to take the word brethren and change it to the word brothers. Okay? Well, now, in the English language, folks, a brother has gender. Okay? Uh, there, there's, you know, there's brothers and there's sisters, and that's how our King James Bible handles it. When Paul talks about divorce, he says in one passage, Romans chapter 7, that a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So anytime in a King James Bible you find the word brother, you find the word sister also, okay? Otherwise, it's the word brethren. Brethren in the English language takes in both sexes, male and female, Okay? Um, brothers, now there is a, you know, the blacks have adopted the word brothers as, as you know, uh, both sexes. I think it's gotten to the place where when they say, well, these are the brothers, you know, they're talking about, 
men and women, you know, guys and gals. So they've kind of adopted that same new translation idea. But the word brother in the King James Bible is for both sexes. The word brother is male and the word sister is female. It's amazing where we're going in this world anymore. Okay? Um, I don't even talk about the cross, you know, mess that's going on out there. It's just, ah, okay, the Kardashian nonsense. All right, here we go. Um, So... Here we find the word brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also, which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now it's obvious to us, after all these years, that this is a reference to the rapture. Okay, For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, Then the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Remember that these epistles were written as letters. They didn't have chapter or verse markings. So you would go right on to the next sentence in your letter and read, But of the times and seasons, brethren, we have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. Imminent return of the Lord. Day of the Lord. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Please notice verse 3, how different that is from the verses previous in chapter chapter 4, beginning of verse 13, where he makes this all very personal. Okay? The wording from 13 to 17, 18 is about us, we which are alive and remain. Okay, he's talking about the, the brethren. And he talks about the brethren in verse 13. Suddenly he changes and he's starting to talk about them and they, not us. Okay, so that should be that should immediately make a red flag fly that we're talking about somebody different in chapter five than we're talking about in chapter four. In chapter four, we're talking about the brethren and the Lord coming in what we understand now and call now since 1850, the rapture. But in chapter five, he's not describing the rapture for many reasons. One thing he calls it the the day of the Lord. And we'll talk about the Greek word for Lord versus the Greek word for Christ here in a little bit. But he's talking about the day of the Lord. He is not describing the rapture. He is describing what most of the Bible describes when it talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we go. It's going to come as a thief in the night. That's what the Lord Jesus said in chapter 23 of Matthew. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman's child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Just read and believe. I don't care what the scholars have said. I don't care who's written what. I don't care how large the churches are. I don't care how renowned the scholarship is. Read the common English and believe it. If we can't believe it here, we can't believe for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed him should not perish but have everlasting life. How can you not believe one verse and believe another in the common English? You see where we're going with all of this stuff? I brought my handy little NIV here with me this morning. I don't do this very often. In fact, I think this is the first time in my seven years here I've ever brought another translation to this, to this body of believers. Now, most of you who know me know where I stand, and hopefully you know why I stand there. But this is a confused mess, and our modern translations just make it all the worse. Okay, and I'll, I'll, you know, if I just stand up here and blah, 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 I don't expect anybody to listen to a word that I say. You know, I can stand up here and tell you anything. I better be able to back up what I say. If there's problems in new translations, I better be able to show them to you, okay? So I'm going to show you one of them today. And by the way, just in case you didn't know this, the RV is the first, that's the revised version, and we're talking 1881 in England, the RV was the first time the Bible was ever, ever copyrighted. The King James Bible is still not copyrighted. Okay, it's, it's the people's book. You own it. You, you can do anything you want to with it. And nobody can take you to court and get money out of you for uh, infringing on the copyright. Because there's no copyright in the King James Bible. But from the, the, the reverse vision, the revised version, okay, of 1881 on, every single Bible is copyrighted. And in order to be copyrighted, you can't be the same as any other book out there. So that means, and this is the standard number, that there has to be at least a 10% difference with every translation 
They have to be 10% different from every other translation back to the RV, which became the RSV, the Revised Standard Version. The ASV, that, the, you know, that fundamentalism, a, a large part of fundamentalism adopted, the American Standard Version started out as the AV, okay, of 1960. Um, if, you go, if you go back, everyone, stop and think about it, every one of those books has to be at least 10% different from the others. Where does that leave us after 400 translations? And we're past the 400 mark now. Where does that leave us? Pretty yeah, pretty messed up. Okay, thank you. That's just good, straight, honest thinking. All right, so the lots of red flags fly here. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me so much if it didn't cause so much weakness and sickness in the body of Christ. That is what bothers me. I don't spend, I learned a long time ago, the best way to get along with people is to have no opinion. I'm serious. The best way to get along with everybody is to have no opinion. If you go visit somebody that you don't know, and you sit there and you say, uh-huh, yeah, right, mm-hmm, yeah, wow, uh-huh, yeah, that was great, see you later. It won't be very long, the phone will ring and they'll ask you back, and again and again and again. Until you say, uh-uh, that doesn't work, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, but... Uh, I think this, or I see this, or I feel, then, depending on the individual involved, then conflict begins. And conflict is ugly, and nobody likes conflict, and it's uncomfortable, and nobody wants conflict. So the body of Christ has decided in the last five or six uh, decades to just ditch controversy, to just stop talking about everything that makes anybody upset. Well, my goodness, we have come to the place where political correctness is now political insanity. And you can't say anything or do anything. And if I said, if I told to a group, if I got on stage at, at Ebenezer's, when I get back there and told that same story I just told you, I would be a racist. I would be a profiler. I would be, if I said anything about somebody coming in, look like they're Middle Eastern with a black backpack, and I was afraid they were going to blow my brains out, I would be in jail probably if I did that public. That is how insane things are getting or are. You think, listen, it's one thing. You guys can talk in your homes, you know, amongst each other and be pretty well protected unless you're super connected. In some homes, I'm scared to talk in anymore because you don't know what Big Brother's listening through. Do you think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. Anyway, that's not the message. I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. And Brian isn't even here. Okay. <laughs> Let's get back on point. Day of the Lord versus the day of Christ. But ye, brethren, verse 4, are not in darkness that that day should overtake, overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let us not uh, sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Are you watching? Are you sober? Uh, or, or are you partying? Are you a party Christian? Is this all about swinging and singing and dancing and, and, and fun and games? What if, what's happened to us? Where are the watchmen? What are the watchmen of the night, Isaiah said? Who, who's looking out for the souls of God's people? I'll let you decide that. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us, the church, to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. Skipping over to chapter 2. Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, there was misunderstanding. Somehow, we're, we're blessed to have chapters, somehow the Thessalonian believers who were not very sharp in the word and not studying all of the, of the you know, letters that were being circulated apparently, not digging very deeply, got very confused and very upset between 1 Thessalonians chapter 13, or, or chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 and chapter 5 uh, verses 1 through 9. They got really upset, put them both together, as all, all modern translations do, and almost all churches do anymore, and thought that this was all about the rapture and didn't differentiate between the rapture in chapter 4 and the revelation in chapter 5. So he wrote back to fix the problem. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. There is no question that our gathering together unto him 
he's talking about the brethren. He's talking about the church. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about those of us that are saved, born again in the age of grace. Not talking about Israel. Israel is nowhere in the chapter, nowhere in the book, nowhere in books on both sides of it, as I remember. Okay, I could be wrong. I don't think on both sides of these Thessalonian epistles, I don't think there's any mention of, of, uh, of Israel or Hebrews. Okay. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word or by letter from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay. Let me read that. Let me read that very same thing to you from the NIV, and you can start with the revised version of 1881 and follow it all the way through. They all make this same very bad error. Now, it'd be interesting if it was just an English problem. But you know that these scholars scream Greek, Greek, Greek until their, their throats bleed. And yet, the Greek word for Lord and the Greek word for Christ are two different words in the original languages. And yet, they stuck with the word Lord and kicked out the word Christ because West Cotton Hort in 1881 could not stand the Plymouth Brethren, they could not stand John Nelson Darby, and they would not believe in the rapture of the church. So they took it out of their, their Greek manuscript. And from that point on, Nessel, Allen, Metzger, every single new English Bible, excuse me, on the market, based on all of those uh, Greek texts, those Greek texts are all based on the Alexandrian text used by West Cotton Hort in 1881 to produce the revised version. They're wrong. Okay? Let me read it to you. You decide for yourself. I believe, I'm an American. I love freedom. You may leave here believing I'm wrong. You have that right. You don't have to believe me just because I'm me. As a matter of fact, just because I'm me is no good reason to believe anything. Okay? You just decide for yourself. That's the neat thing about America. And, you know, personally, when it comes to conflict, I don't, you know, the older I get, the less conflict I have. Yeah, I understand we disagree on things. And I understand, and I say we, I'm just talking about people in general. But we all disagree on things. I'm not saying my way or the highway. I was raised that way. I was raised a militant fundamentalist. I have rejected that. It's not scriptural. It's not biblical. It's not Christ. Christ was not my way or the highway, except heaven. Okay? And I will, that's my only, my way or the highway. It's not my way, it's God's way. But, you know, there is only one name given among men whereby you must be saved, and his name is Jesus Christ. Period, exclamation point, sorry, won't back down, won't, won't walk sideways, won't skate around it, won't, won't ignore it, won't overlook it, can't go there. But most anything else, I'll just smile and say, well, whatever, it's a free country, you know, believe what you want to believe. Okay, let's read instead of yak. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, NIV. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, <laughs> okay, that lets you ladies out in the English language, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. What's your Bible? What's your King James Bible say? Day of Christ. All right. Now, if I was just up here with an axe to grind, that'd be one thing. But the very Greek that, that is, is, and you know I don't do this very often. I'm going to move on and not hardly ever do this again. But this whole so-called King James only argument and, and all of this, all of this fighting and nonsense that goes on on the peripheral of all of this, it's always based in the so-called original languages, which in the Old Testament would be Hebrew and the New Testament would be Greek. There are no copies of copies of copies of any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. There is no copy of any of the books that Paul wrote, direct copy, that he actually wrote, or Tychicus, or, or uh, uh, Sosthenes. You know, he had other people write many of his letters. He wrote some of them himself, or parts of them. There are no original autographs left. That is a smokescreen. It is just something to keep the uninitiated and the uninformed in the dark. If you go back into manuscript history, and I've studied it thoroughly, you go back into manuscript history, you cannot find a single copy of the original Greek of any New Testament book. You only find copies of copies of copies, and in most cases, they are pieces of copies, not even whole books or chapters. Okay, that being said, there's so much emphasis put on the, the original Greek, the original Greek. How many of you are familiar with James Strong, a Strong's Concordance? All right, 
All right, here is, I mean, this is the, Strong's Concordance has been the concordance of our modern times ever since the middle 1700s when, or the late, or middle 1800s, I'm sorry, when he wrote it. This has, this has been the standard Greek and Hebrew lexicon for ever and ever, okay, in our lifetime, all right? Strong's Greek Dictionary, Day of the Lord. The word is number 2,962 2, in the column, and it is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S. This is directly out of, you can go get yourself a Strong's, or you can get yourself a Cruden's, or you can get yourself a, a, what's the other one, Strong for the Strong, Cruden's for the Crude, Young for the Youngs. You can go get a Young's concordance, okay? Pick your concordance. It's, it's exactly the same. This is verbatim copied out of the concordance. The concordance. Okay, from kuros, supremacy, supreme in authority, in other words, as a noun, a controller, by implication, master, as respectful title, God, Lord, Master, Sir. Okay, that's kurios, Lord, the day of the Lord. Strong's Greek Dictionary, word number, and that, that is from the day of the Lord in chapter 1, or, or 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm sorry, in Chapter 5 and verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord. Okay, that, that word Lord is kurios. All right, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled spirit, word of the letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay, since it says the day of, of the Lord in this, and all modern translations, it must be kurios. Right? Wrong. It's Christos. And you're probably more familiar with the word Christos or Christos. You probably heard that more than you have kurios. Okay, it's, it's word number 5,547 in Strong's Greek Dictionary. It's Christos. It means anointed. In other words, the Messiah, an epithet for Jesus or Christ. Okay? The King James translators realized in 1611 the difference between 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 18 through, or 13 through 18, which is a reference to the rapture, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, day of the Lord, 1 through 9, as a reference to the revelation. Okay? They understood the difference between the two. They stayed with the correct Greek word, and they translated it Christ. Okay? All modern translations drop the word Christos, insert the word kurios, and tell you that it's the day of the Lord, that the rapture, they don't even believe in the rapture, because the day of the Lord couldn't possibly be the rapture. You say, why is that so? I'm running a little short on time. Let me give you some verses. Okay. Uh, Matthew 24, 35 through 44. Therefore, actually we ought to go to 2 Peter 3.10. Let's go there first. All right. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The, th the same thing that Paul said. They both said the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is the revelation of Christ. It's going to catch the world by surprise. They are going to be establishing a false peace. It's going to go to hell under the Antichrist. And then the Lord's going to show up in the middle of this whole mess that they think they are going to fix. And then he's going to fix them and everything else on this planet. Okay? That is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not coming in the clouds to snatch away the church in one ten thousandth of a second called the rapture. We call it the rapture. But coming to this earth over a 24-hour period while everybody, including Israel, will see him. Coming to save the remnant of Israel from the Antichrist and setting up the millennial kingdom and staying here physically for a thousand years. It's called the millennium. Those are two different days. They separate each other by at least seven years. At least seven years. Okay. Peter talks about the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Does that sound like the rapture to you? When the rapture comes, are the heavens going to pass away with a great noise? Are the elements of this earth going to melt with a fervent heat? Is the earth and the works thereof going to be burned? No, we're just going to slip out of here, and the whole place is going to go insane for a while until they figure out some kind of explanation. You know, now they found a piece of the Malaysian jet. I don't believe it for a minute. That's just me. You can believe whatever you want, okay? I don't believe it for a minute, all right? Ah, 
oh, the, the extraterrestrials got them, you know, whatever. There's going to be some kind of explanation. You say, is there anything out there? You bet there's something out there. The prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh through the children of disobedience. There is a legion of devils out there, folks. Just because we can't see them doesn't mean they aren't there. God said they're there. God said they're busy. God said they're doing their thing. They did it in Genesis 6. They're doing it today. As it was in the days of who? Noah. Noah. So, shall it, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man? Go back and study Genesis 6. You will understand today. You will watch the news and be far ahead of them. You think it's bad now? It's only going to get worse. Yes, they're going to be marrying their dogs and their cats. I have no doubt at all. It'll never end. The filthiness will get abominable. And then God's going to have to come back here and burn it to ashes and, and fix it and make it, make it right. That's, that's just where we're headed. Okay, Matthew 24, 35 through 44. Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Notice the taken in verses 40 and 41. Taken to judgment. See, took in 39. They were taken in a judgment of the flood in, in Noah's day. They're going to be taken, a taken in a judgment of fire at the second coming of Christ in the Revelation. Now let's just read through some, some more references. Acts 2.20. Here's Peter. Peter's preaching at Pentecost. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Was he preaching about the rapture? He knew nothing of the rapture. Jesus told nobody about the rapture except Paul. Period. Amos 5.18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Do you desire the second coming of Christ in the rapture? I hope you do. Woe unto you. You desire the day of the Lord. This book said the day of the Lord is the rapture. It identified the day of the Lord with the rapture. So woe unto you folks and myself for praying, Lord, even so come. Woe unto John. The end of Revelation, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's not, that's not anything to pray. You should... Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And you, you can you know, go on and read and read and read all you want. Joel, this is the classic uh, chapter. This is the chapter, by the way, that this, this is the chapter. It wasn't, wasn't a chapter. But this is the prophet, and we see it as a chapter, that uh, Peter was, was um, quoting at Pentecost. Joel 2.31. See if this sounds like the rapture. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. A great and terrible day. He says again in 314, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. That's a reference to Armageddon. That's not a reference to being snatched off the earth and everybody scratching their head and saying, where did they go? <laughs> and then come up with a, some kind of lie, you know, make it all okay. You don't think they're lying to you on the news? You need to wake up. I'm serious. I can't I can already sit there and watch this stuff anymore and not beat my head against the wall. You just want to reach in there and tear their tongues out of their throat sometimes. And they're just giving you the bananas. And they do it with a straight face, look you right in the eye and lie like the devil himself. And we have some people up for candidacy that do that kind of thing. You want to be president of the United States. Not like no presidents before us ever lied, but anyway before our time. Okay. Um, the day of the Lord is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The day of Christ is the rapture of the church. Now, we do have some references to the day of Christ, a couple more. Philippians, Paul gives us two. One ten that ye may approve things that are excellent, ye be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, not the day of the Lord. You know, I never looked it up in the NIV, and I'm not going to take the time now, we're out of time. That would be interesting to see what they, you know, how they uh, uh, translated uh, the word Christ in Philippians 1.10 and 2.16. Ho holding forth the word of life, and I may, this is my life verse. Holding forth the word of life, and I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And of course, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and, and verse 2. All right, so in closing this morning, there's one other, and that's the day of the Lord Jesus. And we never get to that one in this discussion because it's, we're too busy talking about the other two that are so very important. But we will eventually get to the place where we will come to the passages in Romans and Corinthians about the judgment seat of Christ. And then, of course, if you've not ever, if you've never heard that preached or you've never read about it or you don't, you know, that's a, that's a, a brand new one to you, okay, I would suggest you go back and, and, and look up um, the judgment seat of Christ, read the verses, read the passages, because we are all 
eventually, every man is going to be judged. Nobody gets out of judgment. We must all appear. It, it just depends on where you appear and when you appear. You and I are going to appear sometime long before those who are resurrected in the so-called general resurrection um, at the end of the millennium to face the great white throne judgment. Okay, we, we have nothing to do with the great white throne judgment. Well, we do. We're going to be judges, all right? Uh, but our judgment, the church's judgment, is going to happen uh, just after the rapture or somewhere tied into the rapture. Uh, we, don't, we don't get a time. We don't know exactly. But somewhere between here and there, somehow, we must all appear, all, all of us brethren, not you brothers, okay? All of the brethren must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that one we will definitely take a look at as time goes by. But I want you to understand, and I know, you know, sometimes uh, there, this, this King James thing has, has turned into such a, a divisive issue. And I, I think that the, the enemy of our souls would like it to be a divisive issue because that way we can all stay mad at each other, Okay. And people are mad on both sides of that issue. They're mad on both sides of every issue, okay? And there shouldn't be that. If, if, if there wasn't all the anger and all the rhetoric and all the ugliness and all the meanness and, 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 and heaven knows, you know, King James uh, only is, and there are people like that out there, I mean, they are guilty. I, there's no doubt about it. But the other side of the coin is just as nasty too. I have a letter in my uh, office from uh, Bob Jones III, uh, I pastored a church back when I was in my late 20s. I have always loved the King James Bible. I've always preached the King James Bible. I have always trusted the King James Bible. I have many different versions at home. This is one of them. Okay? I've got many of them. A um, lot more of them online now. It's a whole lot easier and cheaper to have them online than it is to buy them. Okay? I got, I've got all kinds of versions, but I only trust one. I only trust my King James Bible. And that's not the, listen, that's not the only reason. I could give you a dozen reasons, but it would take me another you know, hour to do it, okay? Uh, there are many, many, many reasons, not just, not just historical reasons and textual reasons and, and, and you know, yesterday reasons, English reasons, like changing the word Christ to Lord and, and scrambling the understanding of the rapture versus the revelation. The King James Bible is clear about the rapture. Now, by the way, it wasn't until 1850 that John Nelson Darby, I think I mentioned this last week or the week before, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm in the clouds right now as to when I'm here or not here, okay? But I mentioned John Nelson Darby in 1850, the Plymouth Brethren, he was the first one to begin to write to the church about and call it the doctrine of the rapture. And there was a long-standing confusion about that with the Reformationists. And there's a lot of Reformation doctrine I love, and a lot of it's very, very good. But, but I mean, you're going all the way back to 14, 15, 16, you know, century. Uh, by, by the 19th century, people were understanding a whole lot more from their Bible. And they were understanding a whole lot more about prophecy. And John Nelson Darby began to realize the difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, and realize that the day of Christ was the rapture of the church and a special thing that would happen before the revelation and I'll tell you what, his counter, that, that's in, that's in uh, uh, John Nelson Darby is New England. And his counterparts over in England hated his guts. And I mean, they wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote to try to, to, to kill this doctrine of the rapture that I think all of us here probably hold dear. And Westcott and Hort, who are, are they, they, they wrote the first Greek text behind the first new English Bible, okay, the revised version, they wrote the Greek text and they changed it because they hated the doctrine. And, and that has caused endless confusion ever since. And as I say, there's, 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 there's more that could go on. All right, now, I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek in closing, if there's anything I am upset at the Lord about, if there's anything that I would get a little edgy about with, with the Lord Jesus would be, why on earth didn't you come a long time ago. <laughs> Where have you been? And, and this, you know, you, you sit and you watch the news and you talk to, you know, conservative, decent, normal, uh, uh, you know, people. And, 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 you know, we're beginning to cluster into corners and bewail and bemoan the hell that is just exploding all around us. And so fast you can hardly keep up with it. 
we are on a downward spiral that is a greased pig, you know, dropping vertically. <laughs> and you can't stop it. It's, it's, and I'm thankful that I have not only a savior, but I have a husband. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ isn't just my savior. He's my husband. You ladies, if you're married to a good man, and I know this isn't true in every case, but your husband is probably your protector. <laughs> probably. Sometimes it might work the other way around, but probably he's your protector, okay? I have a husband, and he's my protector. I'm not worried about what's going on. I'm concerned about it, but I'm not worried about it. Because there is a day coming when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to quietly, oh, there'll be a noise, but I don't think the, the I don't think anybody on this planet outside of believers are going to recognize, perhaps even hear that noise. It seems that the noise is our new name being called. Okay? Oh, we're going to hear a noise. But the world's just going to wake up to the reality that this place is a mangled mess because planes have crashed and cars have wrecked and you, you know boats have capsized and you can just you know you've seen the movies, you've read the books, you've you know you, they try to depict it. But you know, even Hollywood can only do so much, all right? You can think of the massive global mess left behind after all of us are gone in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to take a while for things to normalize, okay? But it's a quiet. They're gone. Zip. It's not, it's not a, a, a hell on earth, moon turning to blood, earthquakes, devastation, gig, gigantic Middle Eastern war. These are two separate events. If you can keep that in your mind, and if that can become a natural part of your thinking process as a Christian, it will help you to realize that when it gets too bad for God to take care of us down here, he'll take us to be with himself. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for your love for us. We're thankful that you are a protector. We're thankful that you didn't just save us from our sins, but you saved us from sin. And this world is a muck in sin. It is sinful. That's why you ask us to come out from among them and be, and be separate and not touch the unclean thing. We're, we're supposed to be a peculiar people, a called out assembly, just as you called out Israel in the Old Testament for yourself so your son is calling out by the holy spirit a people unto himself his bride and lord help us to want to be pure and help us to want to be clean lord we're, we're sick of our sin and we hate ourselves this world says love yourself pamper yourself it's all about you it's the big i i i no it's about you jesus it's about you it is not about us and lord i pray that you would help us as your bride to love you to the place where we are concerned about what you want from us. That we would talk and walk and act and be the kind of wife that you want us to be. We men, we take a look at our wives and we have an idea of what we want from them. That should translate, Lord, to us understanding that you look at us and you have an idea about what you want from us. And Lord, are we going to be a willing, sacrificial wife or are we going to be rebellious? and get our, our heels up, and, and start flapping our tongue, getting angry and mad, and saying, no, 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 you can't have anything I don't want to give. No, Lord, may we be willing to give it all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to thee I freely give. I pray that that would be truly our heart's cry this morning. Bless your people. Strengthen us. We need it, Lord. I don't see things getting better. I see things getting worse. I believe we're not in a cycle. I believe we're about ready to break out of that cycle. I think we are truly at the end of the tether. I believe we're in the last of the last of the last of the last days. Strengthen us by your spirit. Strengthen us by your word. Strengthen us by our fellowship together. Strengthen us, Lord, by our self-determination, by your spirit to stand. And having done all, Paul says, to stand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.